Five, four, three. And we are back, folks. You're on the Michigan Insider Sports Talk 1050 WTKA online at WTKA.com. Sam Webb, Mr. Ira Weintraub on the other side. And joining us as they do every single week for the MGO Blog Roundtable is the MGO Blog crew. Starting off first with the man that started it all at MGO Blog. His name is Brian Cook. Brian, good morning. How are you? I am well. That is good to hear you are well, my friend. Seth Fisher, how are you this morning? Pitchers and catchers reported, so baseball season, let's go. It sure is, man. I'm hoping that the Tigers actually are relevant uh, this year. We shall see. And then, of course, Craig Ross. Craig, good morning. How are you? I'm fine. I'm still in Kona. Uh, shout out to Pat Angolia, who claims she's going to listen to this show today. Maybe her last listen, but we have someone as far west as uh kona listening uh listen listening to us i, w- I want to ask a question of seth uh, and brian i think they compared the ncaa to the romanoff in their in their podcast this week and i would suggest they're closer to the habsburgs because the habsburgs uh intermarried and and they became not so smart and so the, the Romanovs had a lot more vitality uh, than the NCAA will ever I, have. I have news for you, Craig. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the Romanovs, Romanovs were Habsburgs as well. Oh. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> if you were a royal, you were. I mean, yeah, I, one of them was from the. I, I, she, well, they, they were all intermarried. They were all. <laughs> it, was, it was all the same tiny little gene pool of idiots in charge of things <laughs> okay. for a long time. I stand corrected. <laughs> I never know what to do with this as a parent because the kids love playing with kings and queens and princesses and castles. And I'm just like, do you understand how bad the system of government was? It was awful. <laughs> Their cognition has been inhibited by incest. Bad <laughs> government. So are we talking about the NCAA? Here? Are we back to where you started, Craig? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Right. Now we got that out of our system. Ah, oh. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, let's go. You're right. I hear you. Hey, man, leave it to Craig. All right. So we actually have a week where there's no coaching news because his, you know, his staff uh, is 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 intact. No people are going to ask me a bunch of questions about Mike Hart. I've said on my message board a number of times. Uh, he was in a contract negotiation. Uh, started had to tend to some some personal things and put it on pause, and then we'll see where things uh, go. Um, you know, once he's done t- tending to uh, his his personal matter. Uh, what did happen over the course of the past week, though, is the the first sort of you know kind of meaningful entry into the transfer portal. And tomorrow is the close of the window. So the twenty third is the is the last day from the Harbaugh window. And they've done pretty, they've done really well of holding on to it, of holding on to this roster, Brian, starting with the hire of Sharon Moore, then the uh, the collectives uh, step up and step forward and, and do their part in helping Michigan retain its roster. And then the hires, and the hires, they, that does its part, which was the last pillar, if you will, of keeping the roster together. But they did lose Keon Sab who jumped in the portal. I think he was in there a few days and wound up going to Bama. What did you make of that development? Well, it's disappointing because, of course, Seb was very, very good in the national championship game. And with uh, Quentin Johnson headed to the draft, I mean, he was going to get two-thirds of Michigan snaps minimum, right? And there was a a chance that one of those safeties ends up playing a lot of nickel. So I, I felt like... He had a clear path to a lot of playing time, maybe not 80% of the snaps, but, you know, two thirds of them easily Um, in a system that he knows in a place that he originally committed to. So to me, it felt like there was a platform for him to have a big year and go to the NFL next year, which is pretty much the only reason that you would leave. Um, So I feel it's a little short sighted. I don't want to judge anybody, but. It feels like jumping from what looks like a national championship caliber defense to an Alabama team that's very good, but is experiencing a lot of transition costs under Nick Saban. Um, 
not something that I expected. It's disappointing. I think he's going to be a really good player at Bama and, you know, wish him luck. But uh, Michigan will be happy that they're returning Macari Page and, and Rod Moore, which is, you know, I'm disappointed that Sab left. But, you know, objectively, this safety pairing is probably the best Michigan's had going into a season in as long in as long as I can remember. Yeah, Seth? Zeke Perry is probably really happy about it. <laughs> it's like, oh, bye, Keon. See ya. I'm glad. Thanks for the snaps. But um, I did notice that. I mean, Michigan put a lot of time into Sab last year too. So you saw him against Indiana. He wasn't good. He didn't know what he was doing out there yet. They gave him time to get out there and get uh and get his feet under him. And by the Alabama game, he was really making plays. And it it's disappointing because like you know they put a lot of time into making him what he was, and then you. You miss out on the NFL season. I did notice, though, that there are more people at Alabama who recruited Sab to Michigan than there are at Michigan right now. They got Courtney Morgan. And if you look at our defensive staff and everyone who was involved in Sab's recruitment, it was like Jay Harbaugh. He's gone. You know, Ron Bellamy. Ron Ron Bellamy. Oh, Bellamy. Yeah. Bellamy's around. Yeah. So but like they but Bellamy's over on the on the offense. So it's not like. I, I I'm just I'm surprised Michigan kept as many guys as we did, especially as you know so many defensive coaches left, and I'm sure that the um, players had something to do with, or at least were consulted on their decisions and who they wanted to hire, because it's you you can tell that like they lost some guys that they really liked. They really liked Elston. Clint Scale was a major reason a lot of those players had come here, and if they weren't getting somebody that they wanted, I think we probably would have lost a lot more players. Um, and I mean, I, I hate losing Sab, but I, I get it. If he wasn't officially going to, st- you know, if he thought he wasn't going to quote Stark, even though he was getting two thirds of snaps or whatever. Um, and Alabama is going to come with guns blazing. And right now, if you need a safety and they need a safety, right? Caleb Downs was taken from them. Mm-hmm. And, if you need to make a big splash, there is not, it's not like NFL free agency where like people are going to be dropped because they can't, uh, you know, they don't fit in the salary cap. This is the only way to get them right now is to go throw, you know, go to someone's team who's available. And the only team you can poach from right now is Michigan. And then that lasts another 24 hours. And then the, the transfer window is closed and you're in spring ball. And then you have to find someone who lost their job in spring or who's a little mad about what's going on there. So this was their only opportunity. That was like the last guy that Alabama could really go for. And the NCAA has created a pretty bad situation for themselves because the value of these players is going to shoot up like crazy. Because you're going to find a team that doesn't have a defensive tackle and has everything else. And like, imagine if 2019 Michigan could have looked in the portal and been like, hey, let's grab somebody's defensive tackle for $2 million this year, and it would have saved the season. Craig? Yeah, I, I'm a bit concerned, uh, not so much about safety as, as long as, as we stay reasonably healthy there, but I'm concerned about the slot corner uh, and and who's sliding over there. I assume it's McBurrows. Is that right? And But I'm not it's sure not what... It's McBurrows now. I think, yeah. that, I think that it was likely, and this gets to, to Brian, Brian uh, made a, uh, some really, really key points here to highlight. Uh, very perceptive about the the three year thing. I think I know he had in his mind he's a three year guy, right? And so um, that being the case, yeah, the, the the real concern about being part of a rotation that might be inflamed some. It, it maybe to the point of uh, probably being a little too concerned. About a super talented, and I think one of those guys is going to move to nickel. Uh, whether it be uh, with Rod Moore or if you need big nickel situations, it would be uh, Makari, but I don't think it was going to be Keon. And I think, I think that you know, the rotation that he experienced last year, which I think really uh, was playing in his, in his mind a lot, started out the season starting because of Rod Moore's injury. Then Rod comes back and he's playing, but then Quentin comes in. And what he's what he's get like five six snaps in the Rose Bowl, so I think the 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 possibility of there being a rotation of some sort was something that was playing in his mind. Whereas down at at 
down at Bama, do they have other guys? Sure, but not returning starters like like there is at Michigan and you know, all things being equal, which you know, I the, the money from what I hear was was fairly equal. Not that they outspent Michigan because I'm <clears> gonna <throat> say, you know, that the, there was more on the table collective wise uh here. So this wasn't a money decision. This was hey, I clearly feel like I gotta the, the path to what I want to do on the field is clearer at, at at Bama. And so he left. So I uh, Craig, I didn't I, I kind of jumped in. I no, no, that no, that's okay. I mean, you you answered pretty much the question. I mean, uh and you know we're just not going to be quite as deep and you're and you're gonna have a question at the slot corner, which they had a you know, was a question anyway. So uh it's bad that he's gone. We wish we had him, but it still looks like a pretty good defense and a, and and potentially a really good secondary. Yeah, you know, my my takeaway, you you get those and I want to see if you guys are with me on this cuz I mentioned it on on uh drop dimes yesterday with with uh Daniel and and Devin. You know, there are going to be some guys you just can't do anything about. Um don't get don't lose your guys. Like guys that you think are going to be key guys. People are going to raid your depth. But this was supposed to be a, a starting. Don't lose your starting guys for money. And I don't think they lost Keon Sab for money. Mm-hmm. So that's about the most protection that you can you can really provide. Now I think the response is, it's time to tamper, man. It's time <laughs> for Michigan <laughs> to tamper. Tamper, tamper, tamper. You know, not to say, I don't have any say. I can't tell them what to do. And I'm not talking about cheating. I'm talking about the legal tampering. I'm talking about, you know, this coach or these agents are shopping guys around. You aren't talking directly to the player. Seems like a real big gray area. But by the time guys jump in the portal, the the top guys know where they're going to go. How long was Keon in the portal? <laughs> like three oh, yeah. days. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. You, you, yeah. you need to start in the early going, in, in spring ball. The, the, if there are guys on rosters that you have relationships with, that you think might be in a in a state where they would consider jumping in the portal, you you need to be talking to the people around those players right now. So post spring, hey, maybe they do jump in the portal because they know they have a place at Michigan. I think it is time to start doing that. Maybe not to the level that they are doing at other schools, calling the players and parents <clears throat> directly, but this is the environment that that we're in now. Whereas we've seen the collectives. Brian step up monetarily and their Michigan is playing the NIL game. If Michigan was not doing what they had to do NIL wise, you would have all these guys in the portal. I'm just telling you, and I was very outspoken about, they need to step up. This is not going to do, you're going to lose players and they've done it. Now, Mr. Cook, it's time to tamper, man. What say you? I mean, that seems a little, um, aggressive, I guess. Like they had a really good portal class last year. They picked up a couple of guys this year, despite having the transfer um, portal happen at the same time they were losing Jim Harbaugh to the NFL. Like I kind of feels like to some extent they have been doing that. I mean, I'm sure miles Hitton had a pretty good idea of where he was going when he went in the portal. Like, and I saw, I'm pretty sure that Ladarius Henderson, who was in the portal for about two days had a pretty good idea where he was going too. So to some extent, I think that there are, they've already been doing this. Um, You know, they're, they have connections with guys and when someone's thinking about moving, they know that. And I I think mm, the whole tampering stuff is a little overblown because it's what's tampering. Is it having a conversation with the kid's high school coach and being like, we're interested because is it, is it Iowa sending a message to Caden Proctor in the middle of last season being like, keep your head up? Now that's, that's the, and you think that's all they said? Come on, man. Come on. I mean, <laughs> I, I, but Brian's point is if it wasn't illegal for, for like for the purpose, the, these guys are not signed to contracts. Okay. Here's what I'm saying. a league where your people are signed to contracts, it's a different deal. Here, here's what I'm saying. Are there examples where they had some ties that, were a part of Michigan being in the equation for players that were 
uh, we're we're clearly going to be going to the to the portal. Yes, but I'm I'm talking about the guys who aren't talking about going in the portal. That's what I'm talking about. The guys who they might be thinking about what does what's the best route for me moving forward, and it hasn't gotten to the level of contemplating jumping to another school. Well, that's what's happening to Michigan. <laughs> it's like, hey, they aren't even they haven't given off any clues that they're jumping in the portal, and yet they're hearing these suggestions. And and maybe you're, you know, there are a lot of it wasn't like Alabama's the only school. You got Ole Miss, you got um Oregon. I mean, I could rattle off schools. Texas. That, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. That, that, and there, there's a way to do it where you aren't violating the, the rule and you are you are playing the game that is the, the game that's being played right now. Because if, if you aren't doing that, then you're like the only one. I I don't I don't think that 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 it's a I don't have any moral qualms about it. I don't have ethical qualms about it. I think that if the players are signed to contracts that and the contract stated that you can't talk to other teams about things, I I personally don't I don't like that I don't like the portal is such a big option. I don't like that people can transfer. I think that it damages the system that we have where like you're getting an education in the process of playing college football because transfers interrupt your education. I think that as far as talking to somebody who's working somewhere else and saying, hey, you should come work for us. This will be a better opportunity for you. I think that's perfectly fine. And that happens in the job market all the time. I mean, I just you... don't think it's going to be particularly productive. You know, like they, this is already a situation where every single assistant coach in college football is like, maybe I could go to the NFL and have a life. So you got to you got to pick your spots, right? And I'm not sure that poking around a guy who's not indicated that he's in, interested in entering the portal is going to be more productive than recruiting guys who actually have been in the portal and have decided to be in the portal, guys you have <clears throat> connections with, and high school recruits. Like, I just don't know how productive that use of time is because how much time did Alabama fans this week spend talking about getting Will Johnson? <laughs> a Michigan legacy coming off a national championship with a locked in starter spot headed towards the top 10 of the NFL right. draft. Well, you like, know, listen, that was a waste of time. Yeah. True. But if you, if you kick some of those, time, it, it'd be different if you were talking about coaches doing this all the time. This is why this is one of the things you do when you expand your personnel department, you have someone whose job it is to be, monitoring the portal, scouring other rosters, kind of looking at certain dynamics that, that might exist to, to kind of see. And you're right, it was a foolhardy uh, attempt, but they tried it. They, they absolutely tried. That, that wasn't, put it this way. I don't think the fans were just, throw, it, it was just a, a salvo that they, that they tossed with, with nothing behind it. Right, that there was no interest shown from shown by this or their school in this. Come on, man, and that that and that's kind of my point. You just never really know, especially these schools that have new coaches, uh, whether they be head coaches or position coaches. There are opportunity. There are going to be some opportunities post spring. Now, do I want it to be this way? Is this the ideal scenario? To your point, uh, said it's not. But Brian, we were just talking about before the before the break. Did did you see or before we came on? Charlie Baker is like, ah, right, let's do away with any sort of transfer limitations at all. We don't need them at all. Let's let them transfer four or five times if they want. If they want to, you could go in the portal in the spring, and if you don't like it, go back in the portal after the spring. Yeah, I mean, where to follow? Like, there are a lot of NCAA rules that I think are basically just protecting the people who are administrators who are making a lot of money the transfer restrictions were not one of them because I mean, Seth makes a point is like you are in school and you are supposed to be getting a degree from a school. And I think pulling the Frankie Collins invalidates the idea that any degree that you get is going to mean anything. Um, And I know it's a little bit, you know, fanciful to Mm -hmm. believe that every single one of these kids Uh 
is getting a computer engineering degree, but occasionally they do. And I, I kind of feel like the completely unrestricted movement of players is antithetical to what college sports is and should be yeah. for a lot of reasons. We're well past that. that, aren't that we? Is, we don't even do that in pro sports. That's not even this pro. Is not, well, it, this is not a, 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 a thing that Michigan can do something. Michigan's got to play the game in front of them. And I, well, I no, agree I mean, with Sam that they got to go get the guys. But the NCAA should be looking at this from a perspective of what's best for the sport and what's best for the participants in the sport and what's best for the fans. And they're not thinking about any of those entities. They're thinking about their bottom line, and their bottom line right now is they're getting sued over the play player movement, so that's what they're going to say. You know, I don't see that uh, the NCAA has much of a choice on this one absent a bargaining unit or absent contracts with players. I mean, in the, I mean, how can the school say, oh, no, uh, you have to, whether it's football or a degree, how, how can the school say, oh, you have to stay at Michigan when the kid wants to go someplace else for almost any other right. reason? And, and so uh, this one seems to me, uh, quote, not legal. There's and, a there, there's mm -hmm. forcing and there's incentivizing, and and maybe and you could tell me I'm wrong on this, but I think that incentives incentives are completely legal. Incentives can be pretty harsh. Uh, Matt Brown, the um, guy who writes extra points, has been talking about yeah. this a lot. This is like his wheelhouse, but he talks to a lot of like FCS uh, administrators, and like he doesn't just talk to the people in, in the Power Five about what's best for them, and. What he's kind of, what a lot of these people are saying is that they'd like to have surety of their rosters and be willing to give up the ability to go to the portal and whatnot to have some security because they're spending a lot of their time protecting their own rosters instead of going and finding other players. Um, and it's not good for the players. It's not. It's not good for the sport. It's not really good for any of these participants in the game. And the method that you can do it with is some sort of incentive. If the NCAA, if they're and you're right. They're going to need some sort of contracts, but they're going to end up with contracts with the players eventually anyway. It's coming down the pipeline. Well, Once they right. do, what they should, what the NCAA needs to be focused, should be making sure as part of this, is that you have, if you're educating your students, if they're coming to you as a freshman and they're leaving with degrees, that that is a big incentive. That schools will, and that that a player who is, in his third year at a school is way more valuable to that school than he is to another school. Like a Keon Sab, if you stick around at Michigan, you get your degree, you're going to have more financial opportunities. You're going to be able to claim more of your money off of taxes. They can work with the IRS on this kind of thing. There are ways you can incentivize staying at your school and getting your degree. And Brian was right about this from the start, that if you get your degree, you should be able to transfer wherever you want to. That's, that's an incentive that that's and, the rules it, now. So, yeah, right. Well, now now anyone can transfer for any reason. But I that was not a problem that people were transferring anywhere they wanted to as grad as grad transfers. Getting your degree should be a major part of whatever system we create to replace the system we've got now because it's best for the sport, it's best for the teams, it's best for the players. Yeah, you you also nailed it a few minutes ago when you said the only way you're going to get to that point is if the players are – if they have contracts in front of them right. where there's there's some some collectively bargained uh yeah. and, and if there i don't know how you achieve the collective bargaining aspect of this but the you the players are going to have to have some sort of say in any system that puts constraints on them or are you just inviting more lawsuits and that brian's 100%. right that's that's charlie baker's that's his whole point I don't want to get he. I don't know that he truly believes yeah. that players should be able to go wherever they want to go. As much as he believes, I don't want to get sued anymore. We got enough lawsuits, right? So if you don't want to get sued, the players have to have some say in a system that puts some constraints on this. Because this of all the conversations we have about every, what they do as pro, like they train like pros, right? They they uh, you know they they travel like pros. The time commitment. It's like, bro, this part right here, where you go wherever you want to go, whenever you want to go there, you can literally, if right now, if Mario Walker wanted to come back to Michigan, he could jump in the portal, come right back to Michigan. Right? Do That's it. 
<laughs> Tell them we got the NIL figured out. Come back. <laughs> hey, you get my point. They are, to, to stop that, the players are going to have to sign on to it. And the only way you get them to sign on to it is if they are getting some tangible benefit, some tangible piece of this pie that's being negotiated without them. Right now, your only real protection, and I want to get to this point, your only real protection from it being a mass sort of issue is your culture. You know, once you've got all the other pillars in place, you got, you know, you have, uh, you know, the coach they like, the NIL is is good, um, and the coaches that they like. Now, if you aren't going to lose a lot of players to just looking around to the next best thing, I'm I'm going to play a lot here. Brian, what did you say? Like, you know, 60, 70 percent of the snaps. But I want to play 100 percent of the snaps. Only way you really pre- prevent that is you got to have great culture. And I think that was so on display here, fellas. And Keon, even though he left, I think is a perfect example of that because you had guys and Will Johnson. You know, it's ironic that they thought that they could get Will Johnson because Will Johnson was one of the guys working the hardest to keep him at Michigan. (laughs) <laughs> the heart. to the point where he is he is helping open up nil doors for him like i got this and these nil deals over here he's like calling people nil wise like hey you know no we have nil relationship what about my man keon right and then the same thing when it comes <clears throat> to like the, the coaching dynamic you, you i can see from from keon's perspective it being like look you know Jesse was already talking to me about what they were going to do with with the DBs. And so we were going to figure out a way to play them all. And I had questions then. And now it's a coach I don't even know in Wink Martindale. Uh, you might say he doesn't he doesn't know the coaches at, at Bama either. But I can look at that depth chart and say, I know they just lost the starter. I wish he'd watched I, a little bit of Wink's. I wish he watched a little hear, bit of Wink's defense because he blitzes safeties all the time. It's so hear, fun for safeties. Hear you. And, and here, here's the point that I try to make on the, on the board, on my message board. What makes sense to you and I isn't what counts here. It's what makes sense to him. And what makes sense to him is, hey, I see a, a clearer opportunity to, if I compete and win, I know I'm not going to have to rotate as much there as I, or I feel like I'm not going to have to rotate as much there as I might have to at Michigan. When does the portal reopen Af- after spring? Or- yeah, there's a portal open after spring. But but to be clear, Michigan's coaching the the portal that was opened by Jim Harbaugh leaving Jim Harbaugh. that closes tomorrow. Twenty third yeah. is the last day for that. Yeah, but I mean, Michigan could still theoretically go in go into the portal post spring practice, or players or teams could come out. After Michigan players who go into the, into the portal after spring practice, yeah. is that right? Yeah. yeah, but the time to strike for opposing right. teams trying to poach Michigan's roster was now. Now, right? Because you know you have uncertainty about who the coaches are. You can get guys in for spring practice. The chances that Michigan loses a significant contributor after spring is a lot lower than it was immediately after Jim Harbaugh left. So it seems like Michigan has held their roster together with the lone exception of Keon Sab. And that's, I mean, look at what happened to Bama. Bama got raided. They did. And for Michigan to avoid that speaks to the culture, speaks to Sharon Moore's abilities, and speaks to Michigan finally getting their act together on NAL. Like um, they've hired uh, an actual director of it. And one thing that I think Michigan was succeeding in spite of was Jim Harbaugh's attitude towards NIL. Like, it wasn't a priority for him. And Jim Harbaugh had a huge number of assets as a, as a football coach. That wasn't one of them. And I think it's it's good that Sharon seems to be much more amenable to the current state of college athletics because he's not Jim Harbaugh. And he's right. not trying to be Jim Harbaugh. And he's trying to be Sharon Moore. And that means you know, kind of getting with the, the times in a way that a guy like Jim Harbaugh was able to avoid because he is one among many. And I, I think that Michigan, given the fact that Michigan was always going to have a hard time keeping coaches from going to the NFL, NFL, given the state of college football recruiting, where you have to recruit your entire roster over every year. Like, I think 
the transition period has been very encouraging for Morris long term prospects. Yeah, I mean the whole pro. I mean the whole process of having to re recruit your roster every year really does seem more than onerous, and and it feels like there needs to be some some other system. Well, you're not going to have every year where Michigan just won the national championship and then their head coach left. And now there's a month where only you and Alabama and Washington have any players that anybody in the country wants to poach. Like there was a, there was not like everyone was in the portal. The portal was not open for everybody this last few weeks. And for the last week, it's only been Michigan. So if Alabama needed a safety, it's not like they could go and look at Ohio state's roster. I wouldn't go to Ohio state's roster for safety, but it's not like they go to Illinois roster right now. Right. Mich- like Alabama had to focus on Sab because there were there's nobody else they were allowed to poach before spring ball, and there you're not going to have that every year where you're coming off a national championship where you have three safeties who are NFL caliber in the same backfield going going in next year like that was a, just a a strange situation that created the opportunity for Alabama to move in, um, so I I yeah. don't think you're going to have that every year, and here's the thing. I mean, Keon, he he got some we got a chance to see him see uh some flashes where he was a real playmaker, but it's not like there weren't there aren't talented guys that just weren't ready yet, weren't ready to to kind of step to the post. Zeke Berry, who you mentioned, is in that same class. And then Brandon Hillman. Mm-hmm. Let's yeah. forget Brandon Hillman was a really, really talented guy, you know, wound up being a, a flip from Notre Dame. And if you talk to some of the players like man this dude is an absolute playmaker just has to learn the defense so this is this is a big spring for both of those guys uh, because they could each they could grow into being rotation guys this year and not just average like you know Zeke Berry was a higher rated guy than Keon was by the end yeah and I, I Michigan will be fine at safety I mean, losing Sab, the main effect is it's less likely that you're shipping a safety over to that nickel spot and seeing what happens, Mm -hmm. Um, which I thought was a strong possibility if all three of those guys came back. So, um, But we're we're talking about the hole on the defense, right? Everything else is pretty much set except for nickel. And even at nickel, you kind of have an idea that, you know, Burroughs is, McBurroughs is probably going to be the guy. And then again, second corner um and this year you have waller coming back you have hill coming off a red shirt that was largely i believe injury related you have a lot of good options there and and it's it feels strange to be like ah i'm worried about this like no i'm not worried about it <laughs> like <laughs> cuz i don't think michigan is going to win the national championship next year and so huh. the defense being historically good again doesn't have the same kind of stakes so i know they're going to be a very good defense and the difference is like like do they have um something similar to last year or do they have a couple of holes and it's probably they're going to have a couple of holes because that's the way football works you don't get the magical season every year mm-hmm. um i mean really the only thing that i'm super concerned about is what's going to happen a quarterback yeah yeah, that's a, so this is a great pause point because uh, as we kind of look ahead, the staff being uh, being being said, I, again, I uh, keep getting these questions about Mike. I have no nothing to add on Mike other than he's been tending to personal issue. We have to see where things go uh, when he returns. Uh, but now the staff is pretty much set. You're looking ahead to spring ball. And I'm really curious, like what you guys want to see in your – in a perfect world, because I, I think there's some real opportunities uh, with the offensive brain trust. I think Steve Kasula coming back was a huge deal, uh, an experienced play caller who's been in the in the scheme, who's improved offenses before. The Kirk Campbell pairing with him and Sharon. I I just think that there are some opportunities, but you obviously you're breaking in a new quarterback, which could be the limiting factor here. Want to get to that discussion on the other side. Here on the Michigan Insider, MGO Blog Roundtable, Sports Talk 1050, WTK, the ticket. Clear you know, on radio. What I yeah. love about Mick Burroughs is, man, he is a he is a thumper. Of course, he's gonna there's gonna be a drop off from 
from Mikey St. Russell, but not as a tackler. Not as a tackler. Stay, stay tuned I, is what Mikey said. <laughs> yeah, he, stay, he'll be he say? Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, that, remember, remember, like they they put Mikey on the on the mic after the Michigan State game, and he's just like, "No, no, I want you got to you guys got to meet my friend Jane McBurrows. Watch him, watch it." And, they, they, and McBurrows is like, "Wait, wait, I, I wasn't expecting to talk here." He uh, he is he is a thumper. It's just you know he did all of the the expansive sort of coverage concept. They had a the they I'm trying to remember the play. I was talking to Vance about it. Um. They lined up in 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 trips to the field, and there was a, a stagger. And Mikey stepped up to the line, and he was on the he was on the point man, and he kind of waved the guys up, right. And so the way they shook that out, where who who has who in this mix, Vance was like, "Look, I've been coaching thirty well, forty years," and he yeah. said, "The way that they just did that, I've never seen it done like that before. Like I've literally never seen it." The dope, <laughs> those guys, they they are. This is some next level coach. So why do I mention that? Because that's where you know you're going to see like the big Mikey was. He's just on another level as far as that's concerned. So I just don't know that they're going to be able to be quite as as flexible with all of the coverage variations. You know, they might have to they might have to dial that down some. This year was with, with I'm still having a good portion of it. Wink has been on the phone with Jesse Minter talking about many of those things. Uh, but I just with, without Mikey, I don't think you're going to be able to do it quite as much. But you can still be pretty good, even not doing it quite as much as you did all of that last year. You got Rod Moore back there, and you know, I watched a lot of defensive tape this year, and Rod Moore was the one doing a lot of the pointing. I know, I know Mikey was a part of it too, but you know, if you want to talk about who was the captain of the secondary last year, Rod Moore, especially in the end of the year, he was the one pointing everybody where they need to go. So as long as, I mean, that's, he's a, he's a big keep. Rikari Page played a lot of football. Will Johnson's played a lot of football. It's not like you have a bunch of freshmen back there. I, I don't want to be obscene, but I have, I have to mention this one word, basketball. Ugh. <laughs> so what I was saying about <laughs> we, I mean, do we have some obligation to talk? So I think to... Casey Mize is going to be healthy this year. The, uh, the <laughs> Tigers okay. might might challenge the Twins for the AL Central. Um... <laughs> I mean, we could talk if you guys if you guys want it. I don't know what we what to say that we did haven't said already. Yeah, I, we haven't, talked, about we haven't spent seconds, five minutes of basketball in this, on this particular show uh, uh, yeah. uh, all year. I mean, That's kind of a feature, minutes. not a bug there, Craig. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, I, think, I, I mean, I I did a write up of, um, you know, a, a Michigan's backup running back, Cole Cabana, and yeah. people were like, thank you. Thank you for doing this instead of basketball. That was the response I got on the message board. On the other hand, I saw like 300 uh, on your board. Um, Come I back, guys. Stand by. Someone said something about basketball, and there's like 300 responses. Uh, so I don't know. Your call. And we are back on radio in five, four, three. And we are back. back. Get inside us. Let's talk 1050 WTKA online at WTKA.com. Sam Webb, Mr. Ira Wine, Trap on the other side. Before we get back to the MGO Blog Roundtable, want to tell those of you who are in the market for a new vehicle to get on board with Brighton Ford by going to BrightonFord.com. Call 1 800 New Ford or make it out to the lot at 840 West Grand River Avenue in Brighton, Michigan. When you do, you can take advantage of great deals like the one on the 2023 Bronco Sport Big Bid. 253 a month or 3500 down or 376 a month with 500 down or how about the 2023 explorer 324 a month 3500 down or 447 a month with 500 down and last but not least the 2023 f-150 that award-winning pickup 237 a month with 3500 down or 364 a month with 500 down for those and other great deals get on board with brighton ford we're going to brightonford.com call 1-800-NEW-FORD or make it out to the lot at 8240 Grand River Avenue in Brighton, Michigan. So before we went to the break, I sort of posed the question to you guys. The news that Jack Jack Tuttle gets an extra year, right? So you, you get him back. He was in the, in the system 
uh, last year. Many fans pointing to Alex Orgy. Uh, I think Jaden Denegal is a is a sneaky good bet uh, to 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 win this race. But one of the 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 things that I was hoping to see, and I don't know if we're going to be able to, is that the passing game kind of get some uh, some additional wrinkles to it uh, with with Kirk getting the ones and twos, and with Steve Kasula back you know i think there's a recipe for some of that but as you were talking about before we went to the break you know the quarterback situation that's the biggest question mark on the team and that might limit how much you're or probably will limit how much you're able to do with the passing game mr cooks i'm i'm curious your your take on quarterback your take on on the offense under this new new brain trust heading into next year what what do you expect to see what do you want to see well you know, one thing that was very clear after I did the Alabama UFR is that they had Bama's defense like downloaded. And the Tyler Morris touchdown, there's a safety looking up a dig rod that's not coming. And to anticipate what Bama was going to do to defeat Michigan's staples, particularly in the passing game, and to have so many guys wide open. Michigan struggles in that game offensively were all personnel related. They were drop passes, you know, issues throwing the ball. Like the ideas were good. Mm -hmm. And I think Kirk Campbell and Sharon Moore had a lot to do with that. So I'm very, I'm highly encouraged by that. As far as quarterback goes, I think Jack Tuttle is an interesting option. You know, he's a former top 100 guy. Didn't win the job at, at Utah, got stuck behind Mike Penix at Indiana. I mean, Jack Tuttle's probably transferring to Indiana being like, all right, certain job, no problem. <laughs> and then it's like, how does this team have this guy? <laughs> um, and he got hurt too. So Penix was yeah. getting hurt. Tuttle was getting hurt. He's a seventh year player and he's been in college forever. And I think if he can stay healthy, that experience is going to be very helpful. And he's obviously a guy who has some upside now. You know, seven years removed from being a uh, top 100 player, that that shine kind of comes off a little bit. But the shape of his career is such that I believe that he has something to offer, especially because when he was playing at Indiana, that offense was a train wreck. And I don't know, like, there was, um, you know, Penix at Indiana was one thing, and Penix at Washington was another thing. So. Like I think that he's going to be a contender, and I don't I don't want to write him off just because you know it's like oh he's Jack Tuttle we just brought him in he was a captain in Indiana too, and I think that that matters for quarterbacks as well. So personally, I'm I'm hoping for the Alex Orgy single wing offense, but you know <laughs> realistically, I think the most likely opening day starter for Michigan next year is going to be Tuttle. Yeah, right? I yeah I. Uh... I tend to agree with this. I mean, I was very happy to hear Tuttle is coming back. I think what we saw out of him was pretty good. I think he'll, he'll understand the offense. Uh, but the truth is, it's really a, a five-way battle in the spring, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we've seen good stuff out of Davis Warren, who can run it a bit. Uh, I have no idea about Jaden Davis. I assume he'll be redshirted, but who knows? And and Denegal, the little bit we've seen of him in, in spring looks like he has a big arm. And and so and Orgy, of course, uh, our single wing guy. So I, I don't know uh, right now how this is all going to shake out. But if I had to put money on it, I would put I would probably bet that, you know, Tuttle may be the opening day guy pending uh, how, how other players evolve. Can you imagine Seth Fisher as we segue to you if Ohio State loses to Jack Tuttle? And I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not saying that with, with any disrespect. No, I'm saying no. that from the perspective of Ohio State folks, what they would say and think if they lose at home to Jack Tuttle. And so <laughs> they, I mean, Ohio State fans can't admit JJ McCarthy's good, so they're still mad about losing to that guy twice. Not to mention losing to Cade McNamara. Oh my they God. They, I mean, can't, they, they can't admit that Will Johnson is good. <laughs> like they're like, hey, 
Hey, remember when the best receiver in America caught a pass against him? Like at one time, and I'm just like, <laughs> if yeah, I'm they're... ever down that bad on Twitter, just shoot me in the head. <laughs> their, their current conversation is about, is, is about how much better Caleb Downs is than Rod Moore. So that's where Ohio State's conversation is going on. But uh, I, mean, I I don't know. I, I, I've been trying to write the Jack Tuttle uh Thing, uh, right, the thing up on Jack Tuttle right now, and I've been going over and watching his game, and uh, he's got to see the field a lot better than he has been. Um, I don't want to. I John O'Corn gets such a bad rap because like we just got a small segment of his career, and then it was like it got really awful. But like if you could imagine, you know, a chilled down version of that, that's kind of Jack Tuttle's game. Like he he's escapable. He. And he likes to run. I think like his second or third read is normally I want to take off. Uh, once he starts moving around, he doesn't really see the field at all, and he gets into some trouble when he throws. Uh, he tries to throw there. I've been watching his Wisconsin game uh, and a couple other games with Indiana when he, when they actually still had an offense because like last two years he was there they had no offensive line, and then I was watching him in Tuttle time uh, in the middle of the season this year. And granted, it was against Nebraska's defense and Michigan State's defense and those teams didn't, didn't, weren't that great but you know his his first instinct is to take off and I think if Michigan's going to have a guy back there who's primarily a passer I don't think that's necessarily what they want out of the quarterback position so when you talk about Donegal that's that's intriguing to me uh, especially because if the two of them are there at the end of the year they're not getting an eighth year from Tuttle so if if they're tied you might as well go with Donegal and, and see where that takes you yeah I think Craig is uh, is on it with Jaden Davis I think uh, I think the the plan is to redshirt him uh, this year. I think it would be, um, uh, I think it would be a series of unexpected events that would really thrust him, or he would just have to be just phenomenal okay. uh, in spring and fall camp to think that he would be the guy. It's those three guys. I guess I shouldn't uh, completely write off write off Davis Warren, but I I, I think this is mostly a three horse race. And Denegal is intriguing. He has an arm. He obviously isn't the runner that the other two are, but he has some mobility uh, as well. And, you know, when you talk about Alex Orgy, we, we've only seen him a little amount, but as you hear the guys kind of talking about in workouts, you know, the, the challenge for him is going to be, can he, can he be more accurate? Can he be more accurate uh, throwing the football? He'll play. He's going to be a part of it. And you guys talk about, you know, you have some kind of package. There's going to be Alex Orgy on the field, even more so than we've seen, uh, you know, the past couple of years. But can he be the guy? I think that, you know, there have to we're going to have to see some serious uh, growth as a pa- accuracy uh, as a passer for him to beat out. Well, yeah. not just that. Really, really not quickly. Just that. Sorry, really quickly. The, the teams that I've seen go with an orgy like player, when they really maximize that kind of guy, it's because they have someone who's just a jump baller down the field. And Michigan does not have that guy on the roster, unless they do, and we haven't seen very much of them. But that's that's one of the things that you need someone who's going to accurate passer if you want to take advantage of a Tyler Morris. Yeah, it yeah. shall be interesting. Always fun. All right, so Craig. I don't want to totally dismiss. I want to, you, I want to give you an opportunity to get some basketball in. So did you have some basketball observations the last couple of minutes of the show? Well, I mean, this has been the most dreadful season going back to Ellerby. Uh, I really, maybe Beeline's very first team. Uh, but it's, you know, the more you look at it, the crazier the season has been. I mean, you've got, you started with 11 guys, two of them were hurt. And over the course of the season, you've had five healthy players. And, you know, I, the last game against Michigan State, I mean, Michigan played a sort of competent game there, except they turned it over 23 times. And you had uh, Olivier Kamwa, who may be their best player, turn it over eight times. I never heard of a power forward or a forward guy turning it over eight times in a game. Well, it turns out he's playing with a broken wrist. And so, and has been playing with that, you know, for some time. And he had surgery, I believe, the day before yesterday. Uh, so it's just been a, a just a debacle season. 
but I'm the noise is, of course, you know, well, Juwan's going to get fired. No, Juwan's not going to get fired. Uh, the 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 question is, uh, what does he do to sort of piece the program back? And I think he's going to have to fight against his instincts because I think his instincts have been Calipari esque. You know, let's bring the best guys in here, the top guys, and and that and that's not going to work. I'm not sure it works for Calipari. It's definitely not going to work for Michigan. Um, and I think perhaps he's he's seen that and is moving into a slightly different uh, modality where he's saying, okay, let's bring in guys who are going to stay here for three or four years, who aren't the absolute top top guys but are guys we can teach and, and, and piece into a team. Uh, in other words, what Wisconsin and Purdue have done. And Wisconsin doesn't have a guy in the a player in the top 180, uh, and they're still a pretty good basketball team, and Purdue doesn't either. I think they have one guy in the top 100 at, 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 at Purdue. Uh, so uh, I like the three kids they brought in. Uh, you know, the interesting thing and, and a, a spot where I think Brian and I agree to, I don't want to lay this on Brian, but uh, I thought coming into the year, I, I was saying, oh yeah, this Michigan team could be Rutgers. We won't be able to shoot, but we're really going to play defense. Well, never was I wronger about anything. And I've been wrong about a lot of stuff, but I couldn't have been more wrong about that because this is like the most dreadful defensive team in many, in, in many years. Uh but the kids they've got coming in uh, are defenders and uh, and they're not, you know, and because they're not the superstar uh, offensive players, uh, they, they're not viewed quite as highly. But these these kids can play defense. I think they're like not going to the NBA in a year. And so I think fans are just going to have to say, all right, we're starting all over and. Uh, and with a sort of different idea and, and let's move from there. That's my hope at least. Gotcha. That is the final note folks on this week's edition of the MGO blog round table. And so be sure to tune in tomorrow. Ira Weintraub in the air chair. And so a lot in store, John, you bacon and more. Be sure to tune in. Thanks for listening to the Michigan insider on sports talk, 1050 WTK, the ticket, the official voice of the university of Michigan's